Okay, so today can you reach us to represent this work, Grace Abrad Climate Change, as a multi scale phenomenon resulting from monostable excitable dynamics? So, uh, when are you ready, Kino? You, you can start. Yes, I'm ready. <laughs> thanks for the intro. <laughs> thanks for having me today. And thanks for uh, listening right in the middle of the summer break. <laughs> Um, all right. Uh, first, a disclaimer. I mean, this is a probably, I, I don't know, I, I can't remember from the top of my head who of you has been in Munich or at EGU. You might have heard this presentation or parts of it. Today, of course, I have more time, so I can go a little bit more into the details. Um, yeah, but this is this is not brand new. Like, you might have heard it. Um, all right, this is one. And the other thing is, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt me, like in the middle of my presentation. I think we are inofficial enough in this setting to, to do so and to clear questions in between, because if, if you don't and you get lost, then it's, um, yeah, it's, it's not worth the effort than listening to the end. <laughs> um, all right. So, um, yeah, this is, as you might have guessed already, again, stuff, uh, research on the Danska Reschka events in collaboration with uh, Georg Kockwald from Sydney University and Niklas. And so to give you a little warm up, we will again take a little look at the Delta 18O NGRIP um, record from the from Greenland. And yeah, you know this, you can interpret this time series actually as a measure of past temperatures um, from Greenland uh, over the last 110,000 years or up to, until 10,000 years before present, basically covering the last glacier. And you see here, this is a warm cold indicator. This is how to read this graph. And essentially, um, we can see from this graph that actually the Greenland's last glacier's climate can be partitioned in a so-called uh, warm interstadial phases and cold stadial phases. And the prominent or the, the yeah, the interesting thing about this record is that we can see fairly abrupt transitions from the cold state to the warm state, which are the so-called Danska Röschka events. Yeah, but I like to think about these Danska Röschka events always in a, in a little bit more comprehensive way that basically I, I like to speak about Danske Röschka variability because also like the transition back to the cold steady states is also um, important and part of this phenomenon. Um, but yeah, as I mentioned, like these backwards transitions are a little bit less abrupt. Um, and the central question, which is really sticked to this data is what caused the abrupt warming transitions. And um, as I already pointed to, like the two regimes, like this whole variability. And the answer that I'm going to suggest today is that the warming events are actually noise induced excitations of a multi scale system, which then entail prolonged state space excursions. So you have a monostable system that you kick once with a strong noise pulse and if this noise is uh, stronger than a certain critical threshold then your system does something wild in the state space and eventually after this state space excursion it returns to the stable fixed point if you just hit the system subcritically like with not enough force then it does nothing wild it just it's just being distorted from its equilibrium, but then it recovers to the, uh, it relaxes back to the equilibrium pretty fast. This is, yeah, a, a view that I would like to, um, uh, yeah, convey to you. Um, all right, and as an appetizer here, I'm showing uh, a trajectory that we modeled with the model that we uh, that we simulated with the model that. I'm going to present to you in the following uh, minutes. Uh, all right, so a little bit on the physics of stadials and interstadials. Um, so this is a graphic from Docker et al. 
who suggested what I find a plausible way of um, thinking about what possibly happened during the last glacial. And first of all, yeah, this uh, image depicts the interstadial where we have milder Greenland temperatures, um, a reduced sea ice cover in the high latitude North Atlantic. Uh, we have a strong AMOG and cold Nordic seas. So these are the Nordic seas. And you can think of this situation that the this strong AMOG or the active AMOG actually transports a lot of heat to the high northern latitudes. And since we don't have much sea ice cover here, this heat is being efficiently released to the atmosphere, thus warming the atmosphere, which causes the milder Greenland temperatures and cooling the Nordic seas because all the heat goes to the atmosphere, hence what is left is the cold Nordic seas. Um, so that's the interstadial. And opposed to that, we have the stadial situation where we have cold Greenland temperatures, strong sea ice cover, a weak AMOG and warm intermediate Nordic seas. Um, here, so the AMOG is weak, but it is not off. So it still transports some heat at intermediate depth, which is then uh, to, to the high northern latitudes, which is at some point subdued under the sea ice lid. So it really goes below here and then is kind of the heat is kind of trapped here. It cannot be released to the atmosphere because of this insulation by the sea ice. Um, this is why we have the warming at intermediate depth in the Nordic seas. And this is also why we have the cold Greenland temperatures, because there's nothing to warm the atmosphere. And to me, when I first read this, those both both of these situations kind of appeared to me like, yeah, those are the kind of stable situations. Those are both kind of self-sustained situations. Um, because on the left hand side, you need the heat loss to to keep the AMOC running. You need the, the cooling of the water masses to have them sink and then have the AMOC active. But here, once this situation um, is established, those water masses won't sink because they are too warm and hence they are too light. And thus, this situation is also like kind of stuck. Um, so the question is, how do we get from one to the other side? Um, maybe uh, you wonder why we know all this about these two regimes. And well, this is basically because we know it from, from the proxy evidence. And this is just to give you a flavor of, yeah, of, of the large, um, of, the, of the vast quantity of proxies that, that we have from that time. But those are like fairly prominent records, which, yeah, which, which had quite an impact on the, on how we conceived Dunsker Oeschke variability. And here again, so we have this, uh, interstadial with the milder temperature, milder Greenland temperatures, reduced sea ice cover, strong AMOC, cold Nordic seas. So here the color coding immediately points you to the right proxy. So we have the temperature here in orange or red. Uh, the sea ice cover is the green proxy, AMOC blue and purple is the Nordic seas temperatures. And you see that all these proxies co-vary in time. So this is now a little bit like I, I have constrained the time axis here and not showing the entire last glacier because the proxy is uh, some of these proxies are only available in this time frame. Um, but you see that they all vary in phase. And here you see, for example, the sea ice going from large sea ice extent to small sea ice extent um, as the system transitions from a stadial state, which is the blue to the pink, to the interstadial state. And so does the AMOG go from weak to strong and oceanic temperatures from, this is oceanic means here, not exceeds, goes from warm to cold. And yeah, so this is the same thing for the stadials. Uh, all right, I believe this is all clear and potentially not so new to most of you. So let's get to the interesting stuff, um, which is our model. And uh, the starting point would just be a simple Stommel model. 
And here you see the bifurcation diagram of such a simple Stommel model. So um, I'm working here in the state space, which is comprised of T and Q. I mean, when Stommel derived his model, he would start with T and S. T is the temperature gradient between um, equator and pole or high northern latitudes, and S is the corresponding salinity gradient in the North Atlantic. So this are both quantities refer to the North Atlantic. Um, but And then Q is actually the AMOX strength, and Q is defined as T minus S. So it's just a substitution of variables. You can, like, as I said, Henry Stommel started with T and S, but then also used Q in the end because that's the AMOX strength. Uh, but you can also treat these uh, this this model just in the TQ space because it's just a substitution of variables. <clears throat> um, and then those are the two uh, equations of motions for these two variables. And you will find that if you have these two equations, um, or usually you would see this bifurcation diagram with the parameter sigma. Sigma is actually the freshwater forcing, which is applied to the North Atlantic. Usually you would see the very same or similar bifurcation diagram with sigma here. And you would find that also for sigma, you have a region where this model has a single stable fixed point in the 2D state space. So here and there. And you would find a region where this model is bistable, where you have two stable fixed points in the two-dimensional state space. So there is nothing like limit cycles or crazy stuff going on here. It's either you have one fixed point or you have two fixed points in this 2D state space. And now in this case, you see that I used gamma as a bifurcation parameter. Um, and gamma is actually the rate at which the variable t relaxes against the variable theta, or here theta is not yet a variable. So t, as I said, is the temperature gradient between pole and uh, equator. Although we can think that most of the dynamics and most of the changes would, in our case, happen in the in the high northern latitude. So the pole side changes, the equator stays more more or less the same. That's our assumption for also for basically everything which, which comes after this. And here you find that gamma is actually the relaxation rate of T against theta. And theta is, in the Stromme description, it's like a, um, a predefined temperature gradient of the atmosphere. So in the Stromme picture, it's always the ocean that relaxes against the atmosphere. And the atmospheric gradient is set by solar irradiation. Um, so yeah, that's a very fairly simple point of view. And our argument now is that if the ocean relaxes against a predefined temperature gradient, which is set by the atmosphere, this, this must involve somehow heat exchange. Heat must be exchanged between atmosphere and ocean. Hence, we should also consider the atmospheric temperature gradient as the dynamical variable, because the atmospheric temperature gradient must be affected if it exchanges heat with the ocean. And this is why we introduce here the Greenland temperature, or actually, actually theta is a gradient, but we, as I already said, like we assume that the changes happen at the high northern latitudes, not at the pole. And so we can think of this dynamical variable theta as Greenlandic temperatures. And now you see that I uh, that the very same term here, which describes the relaxation of the oceanic temperature against the atmospheric ones, that occurs as well here in the equation of motion for the Greenland temperature, simply because it's the same amount of energy like we take it from the one reservoir and put it into the other. Of course, Greenland temperature, uh, like atmosphere and ocean have different heat capacities. And that's reflected by these um, timescales, tau ocean and tau atmosphere. You can also 
first write it in terms of like heat capacity, which you put on the right hand side of the equation. But then if you divide by that heat capacity, you get actually a different time scale for the uh, temperature equation for the atmosphere temperature equation of motion. Um, all right, so I think but, but we can I guess uh, uh, when you have these different uh, time scales on top, it's I mean they, they don't add to zero, so it's not energy conserving but uh, or temperature conserving to, so to speak. But I guess that's not a problem. Uh, no, it, it it's it's not. Uh, how, how do you mean? It's not tem temperature conserving or energy. Yeah, I mean if you took tau uh, q dot plus theta dot, it only adds to zero if uh, if tau ocean and tau atmosphere is the same. Else, it won't add to zero. Um, ah, you mean because of energy conservation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If it's, but I, I guess that's that's since it's such a distributive system, it doesn't. Make yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It... Mm. I think if we um if we ignore the rest of the equations, those two should in fact. At to z I mean, yeah, then only then, zero if tau ocean and tau atmosphere is the same, right? Uh, uh, yeah, no, but that's then the heat capacities. I mean, yeah. they have different yeah, exactly. heat capacities, yeah, yeah. So, the amount but of the, uh, heat, <laughs> it's the amount of heat, it's not the temperature that is uh, that's exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, the temp, yeah, in terms of temperature, is they don't add up to zero, but in terms of energy, at least this term and this term is really equivalent but then here also for the temperature we have this diffuses diffusive term so we have also introduced some yeah equilibrium is the it's not really the good word but this is a the theta zero is actually as before in the stommel point of view that is some predefined temperature gradient in the atmosphere which is set by uh, solar radiation so if you hadn't had the influence from the ocean then the temperature would always relax against this uh, theta zero. Um, yeah, but in terms of energy, like this energy that for the transfer, we really take the same amount of energy out of the ocean that we put into the atmosphere. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. All right. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, oh, sorry. So now, um, there's some changes we have to do to the bifurcation diagram because we have to add this dynamical variable, which is the Greenland temperature. And yeah, so this is how it looks like. And we still have the situation that this whole three-dimensional model is completely controlled by the heat exchange rate gamma. So if we choose a low heat exchange rate as done here, for example, with a 0 0.7, then there is one fixed point in the three-dimensional state space. And here the dots indicate the value those three variables would assume. If I go to higher heat exchange rates, then again, you see here where the dots are, this is where the variables actually go. And now, the interesting thing for, for our application is that actually for the low heat exchange rate, we have the 3D model in a configuration which corresponds to the stadial state. That is, we have Greenland temperatures, which are cold. We have a weak AMOC and we have relatively warm Nordic seas. Then again, or opposed to that, when we go to high heat exchange rate, we have an interstadial configuration. That means the Greenland temperature is warm, the AMOC is strong, and we have cold Nordic seas. I mean, the difference in the Nordic seas here is very small, but yeah, it becomes larger when I do some further adjustments to the model. Um, so take home message here is low heat exchange rate, all variables are at the stadial configuration. High heat exchange rate, we have an interstadial configuration of the model. 
Um, now you already see in the left hand side in the equations that I always printed this uh, gamma, this heat exchange rate, uh, as a function of I. And I is actually the sea ice. So let us model the heat exchange rate gamma as a function of the sea ice I. And we chose a hyperbolic tangent to, to do so. And if I now do this, this is nothing but a nonlinear transformation of the x-axis. So you see that qualitatively, there's not much going on. This is the bifurcation diagram plotted against the heat exchange rate. Now it's a nonlinear transformation of the x-axis. And I have the sea ice now as a control parameter. And the shape of these night clients slightly changes, but qualitatively it remains the same. Um, all right, <clears throat> so, uh, but for our model, we also would like now to have the sea ice as well as a dynamic variable. And for this aim, we adopted the Eisenman model, which is a yeah conceptual model of sea ice dynamics and coupled it to the Greenland atmospheric temperatures. Um, I must admit, I'm not an expert on sea ice, not at all, but I've talked to some people or to, to a friend of mine who's working on sea ice and he told me that actually sea ice is more driven by the atmospheric temperatures than by the oceanic temperatures. And this is why we coupled the sea ice to the atmosphere and not to the ocean temperature. Um, maybe one could, yeah, if one would like to develop this further, you could also include influence of the ocean temperature on the sea ice growth. But here we just have the sea ice model coupled to the uh, atmospheric temperature. And yeah, so now the next step is uh, <laughs> might be a little confusing for those who see these uh, images the first time, because this allows us actually to print the null line of the sea ice model in the plane which is spanned by sea ice and theta. So this is the additional null line. It's the fourth null line. It might seem strange because we have four dimensions on the left side, or we have a four-dimensional model. And but we can actually express all the dynamic information of this model in in this diagram. Um, it's it's really simply because of the fact that the CS model does not depend on AMOC strength and ocean temperature. It only depends on the Greenland temperature. Um, yeah. So this is if you just if you just considered green and orange for a second and ignored the rest, then this is just a two D state space and you have two Nile clients, and then you see where they intersect. That's the stable fixed point of the 2D, quasi-2D, um, yeah, quasi-2D model. And in fact, it is such that this intersect is determines the fixed point of the 4D model. So this is the only stable point of the 4D model I mean, of course, depending on the parameter configuration that we chose. Um, yeah, but this gives us, um, with the parameter configuration uh, that we choose, this gives us a stable fixed point of this four-dimensional model in the stadial state. We have large sea ice extent. This means, I mean, here, this is positive values, means <laughs> large sea ice, negative values, means uh, little sea ice. We have cold Greenland temperatures. We have a strong, a uh, weak AMOC, and we have warm uh, Nordic seas at intermediate depth. Okay, and so this is the model, and we configured it, and we set it up. And now the question is, how do we get into the interstadial regime? Or how do we how do we get this to do anything interesting? Because if we have a, whatever model and it has just one stable fixed point that doesn't uh, tell us a lot. So what we did here was actually that we initiated the model in the stadial state and then we um, abruptly removed the sea ice 
in a controlled fashion. I mean, in the computer, yeah, in the computer simulations, just we set at time 400 in the simulation, I just set the CI is two minus one. And this is then actually what happens. So you see here on the right hand side, the bold lines are the model simulation. It's initialized in the stadial state. And here aligned with the originally proxy recoded transition to the interstadial, I removed the CIs. And then you see that actually the model fits very well to all the proxies in all four dimensions. Um, yeah, and then you see the relaxation back to the stadial state. And then, of course, our model just goes back to the stadial state because I don't do anything to the model afterwards. It just has one stable fixed point, and we see the relaxation. Um, so, but, um, ah, yeah, and this is, I, uh, yeah, I should mention this. So we already talked a little bit about time scales, and I said that the heat capacity of atmosphere and ocean determines the oceanic and atmospheric time scale separation. And admittedly, the sea ice time scale is just enforced manually. We just chose this as a parameter. Um, and that actually tailoring these time scales really um, allowed us to shape um, this relaxation mechanism. So to, to shape the, these trajectories, depending on the time scales, these would be longer or shorter. Yeah. And okay, so let me try to put this graph a little bit in words to, to explain really the, the physics that's encoded by these trajectories. And so that means that we start in the stable stadial state, then we have the forced abrupt CS removal, which immediately reactivates the heat exchange between ocean and atmosphere. So remember the stadial state means that we have some warm water masses stored underneath the sea ice and above we have the cold atmosphere. We remove the sea ice and suddenly the atmosphere is exposed to the warm water reservoir, which kind of sets a new equilibrium temperature for the atmosphere. And because of the atmosphere has only small heat capacity compared to the ocean, it rapidly adjusts to this new situation. And this is what you see here. I mean, it looks actually in this graph, it looks as if the sea ice and the Greenland temperature um, change at the same time, but in fact, they do not. The sea ice is removed before and only after that, this is a reaction of the model already. Um, so we have the atmospheric warming due to the low heat capacity, which happens almost immediately. Then we have an oceanic cooling, which happens which starts at the same time, but it fully develops only with some inertia because the ocean has the larger heat capacity, it, it develops much slower. And only due to the cooling of this ocean, this is what eventually reinvigorates the AMOC because we need the temperature gradient to become uh, larger and that then drives the temperature that, that reinitiates reinitiates the temperature driven AMOC in the Stommel model. And then you see the AMOC here going up. So, and this is how we arrive in the metastable interstadial state. How do we get back? Well, the point is that um, the sea ice simply regrows, regrows. Our model is configured such that even, even our temperatures they are warmer in the interstadial state, but they are still cold enough to have the CS regrow. It just regrows at a slow rate. Um, but as it regrows, it reduces the heat exchange rate again. Um, and the atmosphere actually quasi adiabatically follows. So the exposure to the heat reservoir, which is the ocean, is um, reduced step by step. and Simultaneously, the temperature here reduces as well. Um, this then allows the, the ocean to already start storing some heat again. So coming from here, which was the coldest point in the evolution of the Nordic Seas, 
we reduce the heat exchange and you see already the build up of heat in the Nordic seas still in the interstate even. So it's warming, it's still cold, but it is a warming trend. Um, yeah, and then at some point, this sea ice regrowth accelerates a lot. And that's actually the point uh, you could, yeah, uh, I can show that better in the video in a second, um, but that's the point where the atmospheric temperature uh, uh, cool past a bifurcation point of the sea ice. And that's where, so to speak, here the sea ice is in a bistable regime. It could exist in the in a large sea ice or in a low sea ice state. And then you take away the large sea ice state and it immediately like drops back to the um yeah to its full full state to, to the large state. And that is also what eventually then brings the aim of to collapse again, and we are back to the stadium state. Yeah, so this is where I quickly wanted to show um, a video. I have to switch here. Um, do you see the video? It's not a video yet. I did press play. So this is um, yeah what I've just explained. So we start. Uh, this is already the left uh, here where the dotted lines begin. This is the interstadial state, but this is already with the sea ice having been removed. And from there on, I let the thing relax. It's just that we have two pairs of of dots, and this first the, the left pair of the uh, triple of dots corresponds to a less strong sea ice removal so this is just a bit of a sea ice removal and it's actually below this is what i meant with the bifurcation point so you have this is the sea ice night line and it has two bifurcation points with respect to the temperature uh, one is here and one is there and here um we remove just uh, so much sea ice that we are not in the regime where the low sea ice branch is actually stable. And this is this is actually the critical threshold for the system and why we decided to call it excitable. So we have to remove more sea ice than, yeah, it's a little higher than zero, this point, the bifurcation point. We have to remove more than that to get really this extended excursion in state space. So this is the large sea ice removal thing. And this is the sea ice regrowing. This is the AMOC and this is the ocean temperature. And honestly, I don't know what happened to the, oh, sorry. No, the first, this dot should be, should be an orange. That's the, that's the Arctic temperature. Excuse me. All right, let's. Get back to the slides. I hope this animation was more helpful than confusing. Um, yeah, it's 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 really a tricky thing if you try to compress four dimensions into two. Um, all right, but we have hopefully understood these physics, which we model with our model. Um, but again, like we don't want to um, remove sea ice by hand at all DO events, which were there in the past, or that, that's simply not, not the purpose. So we need a trigger for all DO events uh, that we add to our model. And in fact, we have chosen to uh, use an alpha stable process that we add to the sea ice temporal evolution. And uh, that acts as noise on the sea ice. And the interesting thing about this alpha stable process is that it has a non-vanishing probability for jumps. Actually, our alpha stable process is designed such that it is directed. So it only has jumps in the negative sea ice direction, so in the sea ice removal direction, it never abruptly adds 
um, large portions of sea ice to the sea ice, but it only removes abruptly large portions of the sea ice. And we motivate this choice of the noise by saying that this might be oceanic convective events. So remind yourself of this, um, of this, uh, uh, how do you say, this scheme, of the schematic presentation of the interstate of the stadial state, where you have this oceanic heat stored underneath the sea ice. And we suggest that if there is an instability in this um, in the stratification, so you have the warm and salty waters underneath actually a thin layer of cold and fresh waters, which, so to speak, shield the sea ice, which is on top from the warm water masses. And if you have a destabilization of the stratification, actually you might have convection and then convective events might melt some portion of the sea ice, which is there. And yeah, so the idea of this model is then actually that if this convective event is strong enough to remove enough sea ice, then you have this little bit of a chain reaction that that actually the atmosphere warms and that you actually reinvigorate the AMOC and all that stuff. But if it is not strong enough, it simply the 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 hole that you get in the sea ice it would just close. So you straightforward relax back to the stadial stable state. And you need the strong, the strong, uh, yeah, perturbation to the system actually to get it all running in this in the state space excursion. And otherwise, you just straight go back to the stable, stable stadial fixed point. Um, yeah. So oceanic convective. You can ask. Uh, I mean, yeah. strictly speaking, you know, I'm saying that this is an alpha stable process. Yeah, you're not permitted to to just take positive values, but you could use the skewness parameter beta to make it very skewed, so it's almost positive. So so in, in, in some mathematical sense, it's not consistent, but any, I mean, you could do whatever. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's it's not an alpha state process unless it fulfills the, the requirement for an alpha state process. Uh, but which, uh, maybe, Peter, could you, could you, um... Could you note down that question and we, we discuss this afterwards? Sure. Yeah, that's cool. Good. <laughs> that would be great. Um, yeah. So I've talked about these oceanic convective events, and there is also like sometimes the idea around that actually the Dunskid Oeschke events are atmospherically triggered. And I mean, there is some evidence from GCMs that sometimes atmospheric anomalies really act on sea ice or, or, and then initiate uh, some, some chain reaction. So we included that here in our list of, of things that could actually motivate the use of such an alpha stable noise. You could also imagine that there is somehow a, yeah, um, an atmospheric anomaly that melts a lot of sea ice from, from above and not from below. Um, yeah. So as I already said, if this perturbation is super critical, then it triggers a DO event in our model. Um, uh, how much time do I have left? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, one final aspect, and then we get to the full model simulation. <laughs> so the final aspect is that actually, you know, that the Dunscott Oeschke events have a very different length. So there were periods where the Danskart Oeschke, uh, the, the, not the Danskart Oeschke events have different length, but the interstadials. So there was a period where these interstadials were quite long and exceeded thousands or 2000 years. And then there was a period where they were all like only three to 400 years long. And in our model, this is incorporated um, by changing actually this background atmospheric temperature gradient. Um, so I told you that the Greenland temperature, this theta, the dynamical variable theta is actually controlled by the heat, ex it's like the heat exchange with the ocean, but also there's this old stormal background temperature atmospheric gradient. And we say that this background rate gradient that had actually changed over the course of the last glacier with 
um, yeah, with this gradient being smaller in the beginning of the last glacial and then increasing towards the last glacial maximum. And um, this is, yeah, so that's basically, it's just one parameter in our model. And what it does is, you see here on the right-hand side that it brings this, um, this nightline of the atmosphere uh, of the, yeah, of the Greenland temperature part of our model, it shifts this nightline higher and lower. And actually, the point is here that the distance between the sea ice nightline and the Greenland temperature nightline determines how fast the um, the relaxation goes. You can see here in the where where I labeled this warm background. These nightlines are very close, and if you imagine now you perturb the system, and you go to the interstadial state, then on the way back to the stadial state, you pass here through a region where these nightlines are almost touching each other, and that means that actually the entire system is very close to an equilibrium state, but but it's not an equilibrium state. But the closer you are to an equilibrium state here in this region the slower your overall relaxation dynamics because yeah so i mean now we have a chance to <laughs> maybe I, I i slept how uh, i mean the green curve uh, i mean it's, it's sea ice and the the brown curve is temperature uh, i mean these are not even same units. I mean, how how can you put them equal? I mean, how 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 should I understand crossing here? Because it's not like ah, okay, this is a different type of diagram than the one you had before. So um, temperature? No, I I, I don't understand. You have I am uh, on one, and the other ones are also functions of sea ice. I'm um. Yeah, no, this is... Uh, what does <laughs> it mean that they cross? Um, it's absolutely justified that you ask this question, Peter. I mean, I have looked at this bifurcation diagram for hours to to, <laughs> to understand what it's telling me. Um, so in this setting, there is no dynamical sea ice. Sea ice is just as a control parameter to our three-dimensional extended Stommel model. Yeah, yeah. This I understand. Okay. Um, and then you make the sea ice dynamical and couple it back to the model. Mm -hmm. The trick is that the sea ice only depends on theta. So, whatever value Q and T take, that doesn't affect um, the sea ice. And that means that you can actually draw the Nile line. I mean, with the Nile line, I mean, um, here, the, the solution for I for any given theta, the, like when you set I dot to zero, you set I dot to zero, you set the left-hand side here to zero, and then you solve for the right-hand side, independence on theta. That's the green line. It's only as if you you could also just consider just this thing, and you have theta as a control parameter. Um, so, so, so what you're really showing uh, for the green line is the theta that would give you i dot is zero. Yeah. So it is really a theta. It's not a sea ice. It's a theta. Yeah. So that one should maybe have been another type of orange. Ah uh, no no no. This is this is really the sea ice. This is the C, depending oh, on the scale of, of theta. Do you have theta in, in the equation here? Yeah, yeah, I understand. I understand. So 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 now I, I take a value of the C ice, which is a one half. Then I go up and I find a value of, uh, of um, uh, no, nah, it's 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 reversed. It's it's reversed, Peter. You you don't you don't prescribe the sea ice in this setting. You prescribe theta. Okay. You say I, I didn't put any numbers here because the numbers are quite meaningless. But say this is one, 
mm -hmm. on this level, mm -hmm. then you put a one here in this equation. Ah, okay. And then you solve the this equation, like you said, i dot to zero. Yes. Then this is the sea ice which corresponds to a given temperature. Got it. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. It's it's so appealing to put all this four-dimensional stuff into two dimension, but it's hard to understand if you only have 20 minutes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so, but if you, I mean, the, the point is that actually this, the three dimensions of the Stommel model, they always have a, uh, they always have just either one fixed point or two fixed points. This is why you don't need to consider so much. You don't need to think so much about the Q and the T because it's just for a given C ice value, the whole Stommel model assumes one state. And then you, if, if you know the theta, then also you can compute Q and T, but it, it's not so, for the dynamics, not so interesting. It's, yeah. So this is why sometimes uh, this this Q and I uh, this theta and I plane is is like the the crucial one, um, and yeah. So I try to go back here, and this is this is now yeah for different theta zeros, which is just shifting this. Uh, temperature null plane up and down in the theta i plane. And the closer they are, then you have a region here where actually all dynamics are slowed down. And this is what, um, what you see here in the left-hand side panels. So we have for the, the top two panels, um, now only show sea ice and greener temperatures. They don't show the other variables because they do similar things. And here I applied sea ice removal of different strength. So initially we start we start in the steady and stable state and I apply sea ice removals. And you see here, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different sea ice removals and then the relaxation back to the steady state. And the above two panels, those correspond to the um, to the warm background climate. These two warm background climate, and then the bottom two panels correspond to the cold background climate. And you see how this change from warm to cold background climate drastically shortens the time uh, of the relaxation. It's because here these night lines are so far away that the system always feels a strong force, a strong um, relaxating force to the stable, stable fixed point. And in the above, as I said, this is almost in equilibrium and hence you have these very long um, interstadial states, which are, yeah, which then are reasonably called metastable because this is almost stable. All right, so in the last step, we couple our entire model to a background climate, which is based on the Lesicki and Remo uh, Delta, uh, Delta 18O stack from, from yeah, LR04, I think most of you know it, which sort of gives an indication of the past global ice volume. And then um, that sort of gives an indication of the background climate. Um, so we couple our model to, to this curve, which is heavily smooth. And then with the alpha stable process, we just let it go. And this is then the trajectory of the Greenland temperature that we get out of our model. And you see that, yeah, like it looks very much like the one that we get from Greenland. And especially we have these abrupt warming events and then we have some major stable state and we have the relaxation. We have longer interstadials here in the early parts of the last glaciers. We have high DO frequency here in, in the marine isotope stage three. And we have, well, we have some DO events during the last glacier maximum, which shouldn't be there, but uh, well, it's a stochastic model. So 
they also can occur there. It's just that they are less likely to occur. And yeah, so that's basically it. Um, uh, this is just some statistics. Uh, if you run the model for a few hundred times, then you actually see that, which I just explained, that the likelihood for GO events during the last station maximum is reduced, that the likelihood is higher in MIS-3, and that on average, interstadials last longer during the early part of the last glacier. Um, but let me come to a summary. Um, so I presented today to you an excitable multi-scale system that reproduces Stenskid-Oeschke variability in terms of greener temperatures, sea ice, AMO, and Nordic seas temperature. So this is, I think, really an interesting aspect of this model that it really captures different climate variable of which we could reproduce or reconstruct the, the Dunskaroshka variability. Um, the sea ice is controlling the atmosphere ocean heat exchange, and that's very important. And because then we can trigger DO events by supercritical stochastic sea ice removal. And interstadials then are modeled in this model as a prolonged state space excursion. And the stadial state is the only stable state. Finally, the background climate dictates the interstadial durations. And yeah, this is our uh, link to the to the archive document where we have uploaded the this work. Yeah, thanks for your attention. Oof, I've almost talked for an hour, and thanks for your endurance. <laughs>